Hello again, this is Michael Whitaker. This is photo post 18 of the 21 photo post I'm doing on LinkedIn and sharing on Facebook. The topic of this post is imagining metaphors. The photo I've chosen for this post is entitled The Picador and the Blindfolded Horse. This is a photo from an unpublished project I did about bullfighting. Before we get started, I need to discuss a little bit what a metaphor is. I had an outstanding, outstanding English teacher in high school, so I learned a lot about metaphors and have used them a lot uh, throughout my life and career. A metaphor is simply a figure of speech. Uh, at least that's where we're going to begin talking about metaphors. It describes or compares two things to help explain an issue or help con uh, make a comparison of similar ideas. Metaphors very often uh, equate two things, uh, look at them as if they're equal, when they're not really equal for the purpose of symbolism. Uh, metaphors are most plentiful in poetry and also in music. And I've given a couple examples uh, in the published post uh, regarding metaphors. They're everywhere in songs. And I've just given three examples here. Neil Young's A Heart of Gold. No one really has a heart of gold. So a heart of gold is a metaphor for someone who has a rich, valuable heart, however you want to describe it. Also, Pink Floyd's Another Brick in the Wall. There's not really a wall and there's not another brick, but they're using the wall and the brick as a metaphor to make a point. And then there's Alicia Keys' uh, Girl on Fire. The girl's not actually on fire. Girl on Fire is a metaphor. That's in literary. That's, that's figures of speech. There are also visual metaphors. And that's when a visual image is used to suggest a particular association. Visual metaphors are extremely common in advertising and movies. Uh, there was a book written back in the 60s, I guess, called The Hidden Persuaders about different techniques that are used to persuade people, to convince people to buy their product. Visual metaphors are very plentiful in advertising, at least in America, and they're also very plentiful uh, in, in motion pictures and movies. Uh, the interesting thing about visual metaphors is there's tons of classes that individuals can take to learn about visual metaphors. If you go to any search engine like Google and type in classes for visual metaphors, pages and pages and pages of links will show up about how to study visual metaphors. They're very important, at least in Western culture. I can't speak to other cultures. But if you want to look at what's available, go on and Google classes for visual metaphors. And I think, like me, you'll be amazed at how many classes there are. Some of them are just people teaching classes. Others are university classes. Those links always end in edu. So there's a ton of classes. Visual metaphors sometimes are created for very specific purposes. I showed you an example uh, and I think it was post 14 of my model, my schematic, schematic representation <clears throat> of the complexities of individuality. As I explained at that time, this model was conceived, conceptualized as a spaceship, even though some of my friends think it's my yellow submarine. But the idea is that individuality is so complex I wanted to show another way. I wanted to present another way of helping people understand 
about what I was talking. So I created this visual metaphor. The, uh, the world portals around the edge are ways that people, issues, events, all sorts of things get into our lives. It's like a spaceship. Those are docking stations. People and events enter our lives through those docking stations. Our self is the main core. It's the thing that drives the spaceship. And then there's all these other issues that are different parts of the spaceship where you can go to deal with a variety of issues. But because I view complex, I view individuality as so complex, I thought this visual metaphor might help people uh, understand the issues I'm addressing. I first created it in 1985, and I've revised it almost every year. I recently, earlier this year, in 2022, revised it. So sometimes people, like me, specifically create visual metaphors to help people understand ideas. There are also people who create visual metaphors, whether they're painters or illustrators or photographers. They set out specifically to create a visual metaphor. I don't create a lot of visual metaphors, but I have created some, and I want to show you one. I need to have a drink of water here. This is a visual metaphor I created in 2006. Uh, I mentioned in a previous post that Thomas Ritchie and I uh, had done a joint show, a uh, gallery show, in Baltimore six years in a row. We started in 2000. Uh, this was the last show that Tom and I were doing together because the gallery had been sold and uh, we just would not have the opportunity to do a joint show, uh, show again. So I wanted to create a visual metaphor to represent the respect I had for Tom and his art. I loved Tom's art. I thought it was beautiful. And I had referred to it on several occasions as a light in a dark forest. So when I got back home, we were living in Memphis at this point. I got back home uh, I, through, uh, with assistance from Tom's wife. I had this print of Tom's made. It's called Lupines. It's of a house he saw in Maine uh, and that he painted the lupines or the flowers down here in front. So I had this uh, uh, print of Tom's, uh, or this image of Tom's printed. Then I went to, uh, down to Habitat for Humanity and I bought this old window frame. And I placed Tom's image in this window frame. Then I attached wires to the top of it, put it all in my car, put a ladder in my car, and drove to a heavily wooded area uh, as the sun was going down. Uh, the sun was behind me, so it's not reflecting much in the image. I got my ladder. I attached it to the lowest limb, attached the wires to the lowest limb I could find, and I took a color photograph of Tom's painting inside this window from Habitat for Humanity uh, in this darkening forest. Uh, and I captured two or three images and I was satisfied, went back home and delved into Photoshop. And I desaturated the forest and left Tom's painting in this window saturated. And I had to uh, remove the wires so you couldn't see the wires hanging down. I had a stool here because I tried several additional props to make it look like uh, something or someone was looking at the window, but none of that worked, so I just uh, left the stool there without a prop on it. But in my mind, Tom's art is a light in a dark forest, and I wanted to create a visual metaphor to express that. So that's what this image is. This is a creative image. Most of my images are captured. I created this image as a visual uh, metaphor. And as the, as the title says, 
uh, in homage to Thomas Ritchie. I was paying my respect to Tom for what I think is his very beautiful art. So visual uh, metaphors can be created. Also, visual metaphors can be captured without anything specifically in mind. And that's what's happened, uh, that's, that's what happens with me more often than not, because I don't create a lot of visual metaphors. I'll see something, you know, I'll see an image, I want to capture that image because it reminds me of a visual metaphor. When I started the project uh, on bullfighting, if you'll remember, Thomas, uh, not Thomas, Rich Hurst, my photo teacher and mentor, challenged me to create a documentary project about something uh, of which I never really approved. And uh, he suggested bullfighting. And at first I said no, but then I said, okay, uh, let's see if I can do uh, a positive documentary project about bullfighting because I'm not really in to bullfighting and don't approve of it. So I studied, uh, did a lot of research, that's sort of my nature, before I picked up my camera the first time, I read all sorts of stuff about bullfighting and found out that for some people, bullfighting is a metaphor, is a metaphor of human struggles against adversity, human struggles against death, human struggles against powerful forces. And for the Spanish, back in the 16th century, a bull was a very uh, powerful image and did well in representing uh, the metaphor of humans struggling against a bull. And I was very interested by that, but I wasn't interested in including that uh, in my documentary project. All I wanted to do was document all aspects of the bullfight, uh, the different things that go on in every part of a Spanish bullfight. So I was just out capturing images of bullfights without the idea of a visual metaphor in my head. I forget which bull ring uh, this image is from. Uh, I know it was one of the smaller bull rings along the the Sun Coast in uh, Spain along the Mediterranean. But it's a relatively small ring, and I, re I know it's a small ring because in small rings, uh, I got more excess and I could get closer. So I was relatively close uh, when I captured this image. At the beginning of every bullfight, sort of the first stage is for the purpose of the matador, uh, getting a feel for how the bull behaves, and also to weaken the bull. The picador is the person riding the horse. The picador has a long lance. As in this picture, the picador jabs the lance with a sharp point on it down between the, the back of the neck, down between the shoulders uh, on, the, on the neck, behind the neck, for the purposes uh, of weakening the bull, and also making it more difficult for the bull to raise his head. So the purpose of this part of the fight is to pierce the muscles uh, behind the neck and the shoulders of the bull, to weaken the bull, and to make it more difficult to raise his head. This is done from horseback because of the angle needed to do that. Uh, it's not evident, it's not clearly evident in this picture, but if you look closely, you'll see the horse is blindfolded. The horse upon which the picador rides is always blindfolded. Once the picador and the horse come out into the ring, there is a natural tendency for the bull to charge the horse just as it's doing here. The bull has lowered its head and it's lifting up under the horse, trying to lift the horse off the ground. These are very large horses. I'm not sure of the breed. 
but the bull can't actually lift the horse. I've seen a couple of budged and sort of lost their balance. But the bull just by its nature tries to go up under the horse and lift it up. That's the reason for the heavy pads. The bull still has its horns. So the bull would gore the horse if the horse didn't have these heavy pads on. Horses are natural or have natural behaviors also. If a horse saw a bull charging at it, the horse would try to get away. They blindfold the horse, so the horse will not try to escape the bull. They want the bull to have impact on the horse so the picador can do his work with the lance. It's really, I was going to say it's really straightforward. It is. Uh, there's, there's not much more than that. And the bull will charge two or three times. I don't think I've ever seen a bull charge more than three times. But that gives the picador two or three chances to weaken the bull before they move on to the next part of the fight. Of all the fights I've been to, and I've been to a lot of bull fights, I've never seen a horse injured. That doesn't make it right. It always bothered me that the horse is blindfolded. But they do that because it would the horse's natural reaction would interfere with the bull hitting the horse. The first time I saw this, it instantly appeared to me as a metaphor of situations where two individuals, two people, let's talk about people, where two people who do not have equal power, uh, one person has more power than the other, one person's in charge, the other person's not. There have been <clears throat> multiple circumstances I've encountered throughout my life where the person in power uh, is interacting with the person with less power in a way that keeps the person with less power in the dark. So to speak, the person is blindfolded because the person in power is not giving out the information because they are concerned that the person without power may not behave in the decide, uh, desired manner if they know all the information. Uh, I listened to a group of soldiers who went to uh, the war in Iraq after 9-11 saying that when they went there, they honestly believed that Saddam had, Hussein had, uh, was responsible for attacking the Twin Towers uh, on 9-11. And when they got back, they were angry because they felt like they had been deceived. That may or not be true. It may or not, may not be that clean cut. But I know there are situations where the people in power deliberately withhold information to get the people beneath them to go along. They do not share all the information uh, because they're afraid they won't achieve their desired outcome if they share all the information. So when I saw this image, <clears throat> excuse me, it just struck me that this is a visual metaphor when information is not equally shared, when people are kept in the dark specifically to influence them to behave in specific ways. Literally, they are kept in the dark to limit their power and control over the situation. And I have used this image several times in training when I talk about self-concept Two of the biggest issues about self-concept are empowerment, feeling the power, that you have the power to do what you want to do, <clears throat> and a thing called locus of control, where you believe the controlling point is in your life. Everybody needs to have internal locus of control. So if you have an internal locus of control, you feel like you have the ability to control your life. If you feel empowered, you feel like you have the power to control your life. At times, people are kept in the dark to limit the feeling, their feelings, 
that they have power and control over themselves. They are the person in control is trying to give the impression that self-determination is not an option in this situation. So there's this photograph, the blindfolded, the blindfolded horse with the picador. I saw it as a metaphor, a visual metaphor. I didn't seek out this image. I didn't set out to find a visual metaphor regarding power and control, but I found it anyway. What I suggest to people is capture the images that you want to capture, but keep in the back of your mind different ways to view those images. Perhaps some of the images are visual metaphors. Some are stronger than others, but you may find different ways to use images that you like and want to share with other people. That's all I'm going to say about metaphors and visual metaphors. Uh, I could talk about them uh, a long time. I've written a book that uh, Christina Bernazzani in Italy will illustrate for me, and it is just page after page after page of metaphors. People understand abstract concepts better with metaphors. That's what you need to take away uh, from this particular photo post. Next time, the first of the last three photo posts is about expecting the unexpected. And I will use one of my favorite photos from Cuba for that. So that's next time. As always, I appreciate your attention. I appreciate your interest in what's going on in my head uh, while I'm capturing images. I'll see you next time. Thank you.